Mortimer, episode 18. Thank you for tuning in to Mortimer, a book written by M.W. Cedars and narrated by Michael Drew. The theme music was written and performed by Danny Torgerson. Mortimer is an entire novel that you may decide to read in print or digital form. Yet each episode of this audio podcast is broken up into a serial of sorts for your enjoyment. We hope you enjoy this duty-free audio presentation of Mortimer. Oh, goodness gracious. All these twists and turns in this true yarn have gotten me dizzy. But I do hope you enjoy the next installment. Fall arrived overnight, with cooler temperatures blowing in from the north coast. Mrs. Peabody was one of the first up and about. Humming softly, she lit the kitchen stove. Outside, happy little birds chirped and flopped around in one of the estate's many bird baths, as if they were rushing in fall. She heard her husband whistling outside as he went about the morning, watering the flower beds. With a contented sigh, she filled the kettle and added the grounds for coffee. Early morning was Mrs. Peabody's favourite time of day. The house was still asleep, and the world was alit with a golden light from the morning sun, and the promise for a wonderful day spread from the edges of the countryside. She'd already finished her first cup of coffee by the time Mrs. Dixon came downstairs. "'It's a beautiful morning,' Mrs. Dixon set the newspaper on the counter. "'Has Neville been in?' "'I haven't seen him,' Mrs. Peabody poured a cup of coffee for Mrs. Dixon. "'Thank you,' Mrs. Dixon accepted the steaming mug. "'I do hope that he got Mortimer to the docks on time. "'So he's really going to Africa?' He has to, Mrs. Dixon shrugged. John made the announcement to all our guests. It would be highly improper for Mortimer to renege on a trip that will, and I quote, make him a man. Oh, such a ridiculous claim. One does not become a man by riding across the sea and, and shooting at poor wild animals. Neville and I agreed before turning in that he'd take care of getting Mortimer to the shipyard on time for the departure. I should have liked to see him off. "'Why, you know that if we had made a big deal out of it, Mortimer may have refused to go.' Millie entered the kitchen with the wild hair and groggy eyes. "'Morning! Oh, came too early!' "'You've worked far too much for such an early sunrise,' Mrs. Peabody drew Millie in for a hug. "'How did you sleep, darling?' "'Like the dead.' "'Millie!' Mrs. Dixon tapped some sugar into her coffee with a silver spoon. "'I should like to have breakfast on the lawn this morning. Do run and fetch Mr. Peabody and ask him to set up two long tables.' Millie nodded wearily and obediently left the kitchen. "'She does look tired,' Mrs. Dixon tasted her coffee. "'It is my responsibility to train her into being one of the finest housemaids in the South. Well, her mother does have high hopes for her. Indeed.' When she is the head of another great mansion, she shall have to work regardless of how early the sun rises. Such a good girl, our Millie. Indeed. Mrs. Dixon and Mrs. Peabody fell silent for a breath and drank their coffees. Then Mrs. Peabody sighed deeply. Oh, Elizabeth, I just can't feel at peace. I would have liked to say goodbye to Mortimer. I've heard terrible stories about how these voyagers are not always safe. Heaven forbid they're caught by storm. Or, or what about pirates? Pirates do not exist, Mrs. Dixon patted Mrs. Peabody's hand soothingly. Well, how do you know? The true pirates disappeared long ago. Now what we have are a bunch of criminals running around the open sea robbing boats, Mrs. Dixon explained. A large ship like Longhorns is too big of a target for robbers. I came over from Jamaica in a boat a quarter the size of the one Mortimer is taking. Mortimer will be just fine. All the same, I do wish I could have seen him off. He'd be back soon enough, and by then we'll have plenty of dates lined up, Mrs. Dixon felt cheered at the prospect. 
Hopefully, we'll have him married off by next season. Mrs Peabody allowed herself to take a slow, deep breath. There was no sense in worrying about Mortimer now. Mrs Dixon was right. Even the late master travelled by boat frequently. They were a shipping family, after all. Elizabeth, there, there is something I must tell you. I should have told you straight away last night, but there were so many people, and, uh, and you did seem stressed. What is it? You see, I was so upset about Mrs Binkley and the kebabs. Dear, do not worry about the Binkleys. We must learn to accept their antics. Why, after this visit, I feel like I know them more intimately than any soul should ever know another. <laughs> I shall endeavour to say that the Binkleys will never surprise me again. It's not the Binkleys, Mrs Peabody interjected. It's John. John who? Ascariot, of course. Mrs Dixon narrowed her eyes. What did he do? The tables are ready. Millie bounded into the kitchen, and immediately sensing an intimate conversation, she straightened her shoulders. I'd be happy to help prepare the food here in the kitchen. Please set the table, Millie, ordered Mrs. Dixon. Millie gathered all of the items and reluctantly rolled the cart back out of the kitchen. Mrs. Peabody leaned back in toward her friend and went on in a whisper. Well, you see, I came into the kitchen and he was meddling with the safe. The safe? Even in their time in Chicago, the Iscariots had always kept the family safe in the kitchen. It was a place that nobody suspected to look, hopefully including potential villains and kleptomaniacs. Mrs. Peabody nodded. I do feel terrible. I see now I should have told you immediately. Uh, what was he looking for? Did he get it open? Do you want flowers or candles on the table? Millie poked her head in through the swinging door. Oh, uh, whatever you would like would be just fine, dear. Mrs. Dixon suppressed her irritation. OK. He did, Mrs. Peabody confirmed out of the door, swung back shut. But he looked rather displeased with what he found. Mrs. Dixon popped up and ran to the safe, which was hidden behind the pans in the cupboard. Her employment contract was stored in there, along with some of the family's most expensive possessions. Diamonds, deeds to the house in Chicago, the mansion in Georgetown, jewellery, as well as a number of other important family documents, including Mortimer's birth certificate. Did he take anything? Well, I don't think so. I, I believe I caught him right away. Mrs. Peabody bit her lip and peeked over Mrs. Dixon's shoulders. Well, everything is still here. Mrs. Dixon sighed with relief, closed the door to the safe and locked it again. Thank goodness. You know... Mrs. Dixon tapped her tapered fingernail to her chin. I caught John snooping around in Mrs. Ascariot's room last evening. Oh, what on earth did he want there? He was looking through her intimates. Mrs. Peabody was horrified. No. Yes, I do believe he was rather drunk, too. Well, oh, what could he have been looking for? That man has been by the mansion quite a bit more often than usual this season. Well, I suppose we shall never know, shall we? Mrs. Dixon said nothing as she sat down and took a sip from her cup. The coffee's cold. I'll warm it up. Uh, there is something else worth mentioning. Mrs. Peabody smiled from the table. Yes? I found two people asleep in the downstairs bath. You did not! Mrs. Dixon set a cup down with a loud clatter. Who? Well, I have no idea who the lady was, but I recognise the man as the one who was friends with the younger Mr. Bernard. S such an unfortunate acquaintance. The fellow who was caught in Lily Lou. Yes, Mr. Bernard's friend. Was this man young, thin, with dark hair and a cocky smile? Well, he was about Mortimer's age, yes, but, but I'm not sure about the cocky smile because he did not smile at me. But he did have dark hair. Oh, I bet you that was Frank Smith. Mrs. Dixon decided. He invited himself, showed up alone and flirted with most of the young women. Well, it appeared that he found one in particular that suited his fancy, said Mrs. Peabody with disapproval. I went in the bathroom first thing to begin tidying up as per routine, Mrs. Dixon nodded as her friend went on. Well, I saw them just lying together asleep, no rings on their fingers and propriety at all. Oh, my! In our tub! Mrs. Peabody was indignant. This house is not a den of sins. So what did you do? Mrs. Peabody was smug. I took a page out of your book. Cold water? The very. <laughs> oh, I'm proud of you, dearest. They giggled together over their teacups. Quite apropos.
Oh, it's nice to see you two laughing. Mr Peabody removed his hat as he entered through the back door to the kitchen. Good morning, Mrs Dixon smiled at Mr Peabody before turning sheepishly toward Mrs Peabody. It has been rather serious around here, hasn't it? I do fear I owe you a great debt of gratitude. Mr Peabody kissed his wife on the head and went to wash his hands in the kitchen sink. Darling Elizabeth, Mrs Peabody put her hand on Mrs Dixon's, you are always nothing. But this whole thing was my idea so that I could go back to Jamaica. Oh, shush, we know you love us, but we also know that you miss your home and your children. More than ever, now that Mortimer is grown. Milly is almost a young lady, too. I feel like my time has just run away from me. Mrs Peabody patted her hand soothingly. Now why don't you finish your coffee and we'll have a wonderful family breakfast. Afterwards, let's you and I see about making some calls to set up meetings with Mortimer and the ladies. Mrs Dixon smiled gratefully, her eyes moist with emotion. Thank you, Felinda. That sounds like a wonderful idea. There was a knock at the door. Da, darling, oh, what time is it? Mrs. Longhorn elbowed her husband with lacklustre. Came the moan. Stop yelling at me. Mrs. Longhorn rolled away. Her head was killing her. She put her palm to her forehead as the knock came again. Mr. and Mrs. Longhorn, I've come with your breakfast. Darling, Astrid is at the door. Mrs. Longhorn rolled her aching eyes and forced herself to push up. She fell back once before attempting to sit up again. "'Come in!' her raised voice caused her head to throb like a beating heart. The door opened, and the maid entered. "'Good morning, missus.' Oh, God. "'Morning, Astrid.' Moving slowly, Mrs. Longhorn got up and wrapped a white cashmere robe around her. "'You're early this morning?' "'It's eight o'clock, missus.' Astrid shot her mistress a confused look. Mrs. Longhorn wrinkled her brow in confusion. Astrid had to be mistaken, Mrs. Longhorn decided. She went to the breakfast nook as the maid opened the windows. Oh, my, my, the <laughs> sun is particularly bright this morning, Mrs. Longhorn shielded her eyes. Uh, may I serve you coffee? Oh, yes, yes, Mrs. Longhorn nodded, then turning to her husband. Leopold, do get up, darling, breakfast is here. He groaned in protest as the maid politely pretended she had not heard him, busying herself at putting the cotton napkin in a mistress's lap and briskly removing the silver tray. The smell was overpowering. But just coffee, Astrid. Mrs. Longhorn did her best to keep her composure. She pushed back in the chair. Are you unwell, Mrs.? The maid sounded genuinely concerned. She put the silver lid back on the tray. Has my daughter gotten up yet? Mrs. Longhorn asked with all the willpower she could muster, for she felt terribly nauseated. Hoping her head pain was caused by a delay in her daily cup of coffee, she forced herself to take a sip. No, Mrs. Oh, please, go and wake her. There's something I should like to speak with her about. And what about Mrs. Longhorn? She's not come out yet either. Hasn't she? Mrs. Longhorn shot a concerned look over to her husband, who was still buried under blankets. This was highly unusual, for her mother-in-law was always up with the birds. She straightened herself in her chair. Please do wake her. Of course, Mrs. Astrid quickly excused herself from the master suite. Mrs. Longhorn pushed up from the chair, and coffee in hand she climbed back into bed with her husband. Darling, are you all right, my love? Oh, barely, he groaned. I feel like my head has been smashed by a thousand hammers. Oh, mine also, Mrs. Longhorn nudged her husband with the cup. Have some coffee. It'll do you good. She admired her husband's unruly hair as he pushed himself up from beneath the covers and took a drink from her cup of coffee. What was this I heard about Lily and your mother not being awake yet? Oh, no. Well, it was quite a party, perhaps. All of us need a little extra sleep. Mr. Longhorn did not look convinced. The door burst open and Astrid shot into the room. Seeing the couple in bed together, she immediately flushed. Oh, forgive me! She turned to leave, but Mr. Longhorn's voice stopped her. What is it, Astrid? She paused and then turned around to face them. Her face was stricken with concern and embarrassment. They're not in their room, sir. "'Who's not in their rooms?' 
Mr. Longhorn's voice was dark. The maid clenched her hands before her and looked at the floor. They're, they're both missing. The elder Mrs. Longhorn and Miss Lily Lou are gone. Breakfast was elegant at the Ascariot Manor. Mrs. Peabody had cooked up a feast by the time the Binkleys came down from their room. A charming table was set up on the back patio, complete with white linen, silver, china, and tapered candlesticks. "'Well, ain't this just lovely?' Mrs. Binkley pressed her hands to her heart. "'Look, Jab!' He sauntered up behind her and grabbed her buttocks, causing her to squeak and slap him. Embarrassed by such uncivilised behaviour, Mrs. Peabody forced herself to focus on arranging flowers that had burst out in bits of colour and happiness on each end of the table. "'Do have a seat,' she managed. "'This is just grand!' Mrs. Binkley went to the table and selected a seat. "'Jab, come and sit here by little old me.' Mrs. Peabody glanced over at Millie, who had frozen in her tracks. Her face was the colour of a bright spring tomato, and she stared as Mr. and Mrs. Binkley crossed the lawn. "'Millie!' Mrs. Peabody spoke loudly, jarring the girl from her thoughts. "'Can you take out the coffee?' Silently, Millie turned on a heel and ran into the house. "'Glad we made it down before the boy.' "'Jeb commented to no one in particular "'as he flopped down into a chair. "'Eats like a horse. "'Must have a hollow leg or something. "'Neville?' "'Mrs. Dixon had stayed behind in the kitchen "'while Mrs. Peabody got everything settled outside. "'She smiled as the butler came into the kitchen. "'You are back just in time for breakfast.' "'Confused by her use of the word back, "'Neville wrinkled his brow. "'She handed him the hard rolls and smoked salmon. "'Can you take this out to the table?' "'Okay.' He took the basket and went outside. As Neville left, Millie entered. Coffee! Mrs. Dixon pointed to the canister. Dear! Millie lifted the carafe and went back out the door. Several moments later, Mrs. Dixon had arranged the last of the items to be taken outside. Mrs. Peabody came back into the kitchen just in time to help her carry. Let's all dine together, Mrs. Dixon suggested, to celebrate a successful party and Martimer's future engagement. "'Wonderful idea!' Arms full, Mrs. Peabody bumped the door open with her hip. "'Do you think the mistress will be down this morning?' "'I checked on her an hour or so ago, and she's still asleep. "'She was quite active last night. "'The word that came to my mind was enchanting.' "'Enchanting!' Mrs. Peabody nodded with approval. "'Just like the old days.' "'Together they carried out the last of the food to the garden.' John came out of the back door and followed them to the table. He looked haggard, and his bowler was tipped low over his eyes. Mrs. Dixon shot a look over her shoulder. "'I suppose you would like some breakfast?' "'Absolutely not. I'm not staying,' John growled. "'I just need two cups of coffee.' Suppressing the urge to interrogate the odious prowler, Mrs. Dixon set her items on the table. He was family, and though she felt like she was just as much part of the family as he, she was really, technically, the help. Therefore, she had to be welcoming. Like it or not. Coffee's in the periwinkle-dotted china kettle, dare. Bully. John slumped down next to Jeb and began to pour himself a cup of black. I thought we could all eat together, if that's all right with you, Mrs. Dixon said to the Binkleys. Oh, by all means, Bobby Sue grinned, patting the seat next to her. Once they were all seated, Mrs. Dixon looked about the group. "'Where is your son?' Jeb was already dumping a mass of eggs onto his plate. "'Who?' "'Your son,' Mrs. Dixon repeated. "'Percy Alabaster. "'Ah, oh, don't pay attention, thou Jeb. "'He's quite the dullard until he's got a whole chicken "'and then some into his gullet. <laughs> "'Bobby Sue laughed. "'I'm sure Percy's still asleep.' "'Keep it down,' complained John. "'My head feels like an explosion.' "'Shall we call the doctor?' Mrs. Dixon asked, knowing the etiology of John's illness was due to his unbefitting imbibery from the evening before. "'God, no!' Mrs. Peabody passed the fruit to her left. "'Percy's been one of the first ones up in the morning since y'all arrived. Are you sure he's asleep?' "'He does enjoy breakfasting with his cousin.' Bobby Sue scooped eggs onto her plate. "'The bond between those young uns. Nice to see. "'Do you think we should check on him?' Belinda, darling, enjoy your breakfast. Mrs. Dixon passed the croissant to Bobby Sue. I'm sure Percy is fine. It was a late night for all of us.
It'll be mighty fine to have just us adults here. Jeb shoveled another bite into his mouth, and egg splattered from his lips as he spoke. Well, sides Miss Miller here. Minnie reddened and looked away. Once all the food was passed, Mrs. Dixon folded her hands. She looked pointedly at Jeb, whose bottom lip was level with his plate. He was scooping food into his bulging and cavernous cheeks. I'd like to say grace before we begin. Of course, Mrs. Peabody reached for Millie's hand. Bobby Sue elbowed her husband violently in the ribs. A mound of wet egg shot out of his mouth and back onto his plate. Neville rolled his eyes toward the heavens and held Mrs. Dixon and John's hands as Mrs. Dixon began to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bounty that we are about to receive. We pray for the spirit of Mr. Gerard Iscariot, and we thank you for the mistress's lucid attendance to Mortimer's party. We pray that you will bless Mortimer's trip to Africa. Please bless the Binkley's trip back to West Virginia. Amen. That was lovely, Bobby Sue smiled at Mrs. Dixon. But we ain't in no hurry to go. Ain't no reason to be sad. Mrs. Dixon felt her stomach clench. Don't you have the farm to tend to? Oh, the tobacco grows itself. We just gotta be there to fertilize and harvest. Bobby Sue dug into her plate of food as Jeb went back to his shoveling. Forcing a topic change, Mrs. Dixon turned to Neville. Tell us how it went at the harbour today, Neville. I would hardly know. Mrs. Dixon was in no mood for joking. She glanced over at John, who seemed to have passed out in his chair. Do be serious. Martima, the dock, Africa. We discussed this last night. You were taking him to the harbour. Panic was like a bolt of ice-cold electricity through her body. No, we agreed that you would take him. No, no, you said, and I quote, I can't have Mortimer causing a scene and he never listens to you. That didn't mean I'd take him. Mrs. Dixon shot up from the table. That meant you weren't allowed to let him cause a scene. Neville's face paled. Does that mean he's still in his room? Mrs. Peabody asked the million-dollar question. She's gone. She's not in there. Mrs. Longhorn ran breathlessly back to the lounge, where Mr. Longhorn was already putting on his top hat and coat. We must notify the police. It's under control, he muttered. Then to his wife, I will not risk word of Lily Lou's ridiculous behavior becoming public knowledge. But where is my daughter? The maid rushed to Mrs. Longhorn, coat in hand. Your day wrap, ma'am. Where are we going? I'm sure our youngest is still at the Iscariots. We're just going to have Ivan take us over there in the other car. Put your coat on. We'll head over immediately. Matima! Mrs. Dixon was banging on the young master's bedroom door, but to her dismay there was no answer. With Neville, Mr. Peabody, Mrs. Peabody, and Bobby Sue in tow, she pushed the door open and burst into the room. No one's in here, Mrs. Peabody exclaimed. Why, the bed hasn't even been slept in. Maybe Mortimer made the bed, Mr. Peabody suggested, rendering a look from Mrs. Dixon and his wife. Perhaps he's in a different room. It wouldn't be the first time. Mrs. Dixon began to delegate orders urgently. He has to be here somewhere. We'll split up. Felinda and I will check the second floor. Neville, you, Bobby Sue and Mr. Peabody take the third. Everyone sprang into action. Mrs. Dixon went into the first room, which was empty. Then she peeked into Mrs. Iscariot's room. The mistress was sound asleep in her bed, as she had been an hour earlier. Upstairs, the rooms were checked one by one. Percy, darling, time for breakfast, baby. Bobby Sue knocked on the door to her son's room. Neville checked other doors and did not see the woman's confused expression until she emerged. What is it? She stood in the open doorway, motionless, but before he could answer, there was a scream from upstairs. Neville, Bobby Sue, and Mr. Peabody rushed down the hall with abandon. They screeched to a halt upon seeing Mrs. Peabody and Mrs. Dixon standing outside John Adams' room. "'What are you doing here?' Mrs. Dixon was demanding in a threatening tone. "'That's none of your business!' Neville stopped behind Mrs. Dixon and peered into the darkness. A familiar figure with silver hair and arrogant eyes glared back. His jaw dropped. Jeb burst into laughter. "'Ha!' Ah, why, looks like old Mrs. Longhorn had a wee bit of hanky-panky with our very own John Adams. Ah, ha, ha, ha.
Mr. Longhorn knocked briskly on the door of the Iscariot Manor. His wife stood by his side, dressed in a charcoal-coloured wrap, with her hair pulled elegantly away from her face. I'm sure she's here. There are so many rooms. Perhaps she's enjoying breakfast at this very moment. The door opened, and the butler stood in the doorway. May I help you? Yes, I'm here in search of my daughter, Lily Lou Longhorn. Neville's eyebrows rose. Your daughter is missing? Is she not with you? I do not fraternize with guests, sir. Oh, Leo, Mrs. Longhorn pulled desperately on his sleeve. Where is she? I do insist you let us inside. Of course, the butler opened the door and stepped aside. Mrs. Dixon came down the stairs as the Longhorns entered. Upon seeing Mr. Longhorn standing at the foot of the grand staircase, Mrs. Dixon slowed her descent. Mr. Longhorn did not miss her knuckles clamp against the railing. Mr. Longhorn, Mrs. Longhorn, what a pleasant surprise, she forced a smile. I'm looking for my daughter and my mother. Y your daughter is not here, Mrs. Dixon answered, which provoked another wail from Mrs. Longhorn. But my mother is? At that moment, John Adams rounded the corner into foyer with two cups of coffee in hand. Excuse me, he pushed past the Longhorns without making eye contact. John, if you please, Mrs. Dixon blocked his path. Your guest's family is here to retrieve her? John froze in place. His guest, Mr. Longhorn all but barked out the words. Is this some kind of joke? Clearly terrified, John glanced over his shoulder. It's no joke, said a voice at the top of the stairs. Everyone looked up to see Mrs. Longhorn standing next to Mrs. Binkley. I do not suppose any of you have anything worthwhile to say about it. Therefore, if you will excuse us, I still have some unfinished business with Mr. Ascariot. This is highly inappropriate. I am the Baroness of the late Lord Longhorn. It is not for you people to decide the terms of my obligations or definitions of propriety. Sorry, old chap. John was smug. Why, I order, Mr. Longhorn lunged at John, who yelped and jumped out of his reach. Leopold? Her voice resonated with authority, causing Mr. Longhorn to freeze. I have not felt a man's touch in over fifteen years. Last night I was given so much pleasure. Why, every single inch. My God, shrieked Mr. Longhorn. I can't listen to another word. John chose that moment to make his escape. But Neville had anticipated this and grabbed John by the collar. I do believe this conversation concerns you. I did nothing wrong. John hated how his voice sounded whiny. Perhaps you should take him with you, Neville suggested to Mr. Longhorn. Dismissing the butler, Mr. Longhorn stretched to his full height. Mother, I forbid you to stay here another minute. More behavior like this is absolutely out of the question. Mrs. Binkley, who had been standing by Mrs. Longhorn's side, whispered something into Mrs. Longhorn's ear. The older woman flushed like a schoolgirl. "'You don't say?' Mr. Longhorn turned to Mrs. Dixon. "'I demand to speak to the mistress of the house.' "'I'm afraid she is still asleep.' Mrs. Dixon refused to be intimidated. The last ten minutes had essentially destroyed any chance of Mr. Longhorn allowing his daughter to marry Mortimer. At this point in the game, it was all about damage control. "'My daughter is missing,' Mrs. Longhorn reminded the group. "'The last time she was seen was at this house. "'Did you not take her with you when you left?' "'Mr. Longhorn's brow furrowed, and his wife burst into tears. I, "'I do not quite recall all the details from last evening. "'I assure you, every room has been checked. "'Lily Lou is not here. "'In fact, we were just searching for Mortimer when you arrived. "'Mortimer is missing, too?' Mr. Longhorn felt a sickening sinking in his stomach. God forbid the two of them were together. I am sure that Martima is about to ship to Africa, answered the nanny. We just did not expect him to get to the harbour on his own. Darling, fetch the police immediately. I don't care about our reputation. I must have my daughter back. During the Longhorn's distraction, John had climbed up the stairs, and he, Mrs. Binkley, and the eldest Mrs. Longhorn had disappeared from the landing. Mr. Longhorn looked about him now, his thoughts spinning as to the whereabouts of his dearest daughter, and that idiot good-for-nothing inchoate, Mortimer Ascariot. Mrs. Dixon was wearing a pirate's costume.
She leaned down over Mortimer, and much to his surprise, a growl escaped her throat. The bed was rocking back and forth violently, likely due to the pernicious Percy. Mortimer groaned and flailed his arms in front of him. "'Back away and bring me my sausage! What have we here?' Mortimer felt his stomach turn with his idiotic cousin's romping, and he kicked his feet violently in hopes of contacting Percy's head. "'Trying a little struggle, are we? Ha, ha, ha!' came Mrs. Dixon's voice again. However, Mortimer noted, it did not sound much like her voice. "'Cowlick! Looky what we have here! Ah!' Mortimer rubbed his eyes with his fists and glowered as Neville came in to Mrs. Dixon's side. However, at present, it seemed that Neville was wearing a black cap atop his head, and a patch was over his eye. "'Looks like we found a stowaway! Ha-ha!' <laughs> "'Your idiotic rambling has quite gotten on my nerves!' Mortimer kicked at Percy again. "'I demand my breakfast and stop that rocking!' He felt himself being pulled up. His stomach churned in protest as his arms flailed wildly. Mrs. Dixon was much stronger than he remembered. Once upright, Mortimer's vision cleared, and he looked about him in absolute befuddlement. He was not in his bed, nor in his bedroom. "'Where am I?' he demanded dubiously. "'He be wantin' to know where he be!' laughed the first. "'Aye!' agreed the one called Cowlick. "'A mighty portly stowaway he be!' "'Identify yourself!' Mortimer belched. "'Yeah!' The remnants of last night's ice cream had fermented and was inflating in his bowels. "'Ye old scurvy bastard, listen up! "'The cabin ain't gonna be a smiling too fondly on you being here. "'Ho-ho! Might stick in the bilge, rot! (laughs) "'Ha-ha!' Realisation was slowly sinking in as Mortimer continued to awaken. He was indeed not in the manor, and these two imbeciles were in fact not his nanny nor his butler.' Their halitosis offended Mortimer so violently that he thought he might vomit on the spot. And then there was that vile rocking. He looked about him, his mind reeling as his captors went on. Feed him to the sharks! Stuff his boats with iron! And throw him out to sea! Out to sea? Mortimer spat out. I shall have to decline, for I cannot swim! Sid, Cowlick, what are you two doing? boomed a low voice from behind Mortimer's captors. The first, who to Mortimer's deduction was the one called Sid, immediately released Mortimer and spun around guiltily. Cowling snickered and followed suit as his companion answered for them both. We we found a stowaway. You meaning that man who's a-running over there? The third pointed toward Mortimer, who was staggering across the deck in an attempt to escape. One of his massive feet, however, got caught in a rope. He advanced, shook his leg, ran again, and then hopped twice. But the boat tipped sharply to the side, and with a ladylike shriek, Mortimer belly flopped onto the deck. The three of them were at his side in a moment. Avast! This one ain't got his sea legs! He's as green as a frog! I demand you stop shaking the floor! Bleh! He belched again. This instant! Learn more at www.mortimabook.com. Copyright 2022, M.W. Cedars. Written by M.W. Cedars, the author pseudonym. Audiobook performance by Michael Drew. Neither this author nor affiliates, comrades, patriots or associates are engaged in rendering professional or non-professional advice, services, recommendations or any other suggestions of any kind to the individual reader. This book is purely fiction and all opinions and all likenesses of characters, industries, cities, or associations with any place or anyone you know are purely coincidental. Thank you for subscribing to Mortimer, a book written by M.W. Cedars and narrated by Michael Drew. The theme music was written and performed by Danny Torgerson. Be sure to download the next episode.